Can you say you've seen an ocean? Can you say you've seen the sun? What would you do if it was gone? Cause I have seen them all my love I have seen them all my son And I can see that it's begun
When it's gone Down the road, and I can't see where I've gone. I'm walking 90 miles an hour in the wrong direction. Yeah, where will I go? Where will I stay? I need something now to help me on my way. Still, you tell me that. We are live. Welcome everybody to the Social 19 Q and A with uh, with Sam and well, I guess I'm, but I'm not really answering your questions. I'll be asking we're uh, asking Sam your questions for you. So if you're watching this on YouTube Live, go ahead and look uh, at the chat, which should be on the right hand side, which should be over there. Um, so look at the chat, answer or ask your questions. I'll read them aloud to, to Sam. And he might answer or ask them, and then hopefully he'll answer them. If you're watching this uh, on demand, um, we have a voicemail, 814-430-3555. And uh, you can ask your questions there. And in some class, we might be able to ask your question and have it answered in class. So without further ado, hey, Sam. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's a little bit different being here than in the classroom, but it's nice to be here because um, sometimes for me, it's there There are certain people who watch the stream on a regular basis, and I like to have the opportunity to really speak more directly to you all. Um, I, I appreciate it. Certain you all watching that you are watching, and I also appreciate the kinds of questions that I think that that you would ask that would be very different than the kinds of questions that students ask. And so, um, so I, Yosra, actually, I'm, I see your question right now. Um, what advice or tips do you give to raise awareness? You know, I, I mean, in my earlier incarnation, 
I, I would say I would have called myself much more of an activist. Um, now, I, I, I don't do that. Um, but what I found over the years is my ability to raise awareness about issues correlated with my understanding of those issues and my understanding of myself. And so what I have found is that the more I understand myself and the more I really take my own life journey seriously and get very, also very serious about a deep balanced understanding of issues, the more impact I've been able to have, I think, on other people. Certainly I see it in my teaching, the more positively students respond. And so Yosra, I think what I am saying to you is the one guaranteed positive outcome that you can have in the world is through a, a deeper understanding of yourself and how the issues impact you. And just go from there. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, think I, would, I would say that. And then the social activism is something that happens out there in the world, but that's really important to work from one's own place. Yeah, and that, that's a very simple. Um, okay. What do you have, Mr. Hamill? Why is anti-Latino discrimination never talked about? You know, um, it's, it's interesting that it's not that it's never talked about. I actually used to talk about it a lot in the class. And um, I just, it's like the, the class is a giant ship that just sort of gets, just moves in different directions. Um, but this semester, I have decided that I really want to address Latino and Hispanic issues. So we, we will talk about it for sure. Um, you know, if I was, if we were, if Penn State was in the Southwest of the United States, it would be a prominent issue front and center. It would have to be. Um, but uh, I will be talking about it. So I used to a lot. Then I started to really just talk about immigration, but now I really want to come back to it. Um, especially in light of the current administration that I think has really brought that to the surface. So we will talk about it. Um. Uh, there is a question um, asked uh, about the problem of intersectionality of discrimination against women with disabilities. Oh, man. I think it's interesting or that question because it's like, women in some places around the world already are discriminated against and people with disabilities are discriminated against. And then when you put the two together, it's, I, I would assume even worse. You know, okay. So I often, I, I, I have generally stayed away from the, just the issue of intersectionality in, in the sense that um, I think it's a really, really important concept and it may be, in, when we start talking about discrimination and prejudice and all of the ways that people's lives are, are that, that obstructions are put in front of people um, for, because of their characteristics, either sociological or physiological or so on. Intersectionality is key. It really is key. However, I stay away from it because of how complex it is to talk about it in a way that I think does more good than harm. And by that, I mean, um, in a way that actually helps people to under, to really understand how issues come together. Um, and so what I find is that a lot of people just throw that word out there and I think it just get kind of gets in the way of a deeper understanding of things. So, um, or I think an important understanding of things, but I actually thought that this semester I might spend an entire class talking about intersectionality and really do justice to what, what, what I think it means and how important it is. And, you know, I kind of do, for example, you know, last year, I think it was a year ago, I brought um, quite a number of African students to the front and we talked about class in the context of their ancestry. 
And it really was a way of looking at intersectionality of how these two issues, man, if you don't bring class and nationality and then race together and look at how they intersect, you will ne- you could never understand these five people that were standing in front of class. So that's a cool question. Um, Another one for you if you want it. Um, Jacob asks, what can I do to inform myself? A little bit later, uh, he asked about uh, current issues that might uh, uh, trouble groups I'm not in. So how would you educate yourself about issues in a group that you don't belong to? Mm. That's a really good question. <laughs> Stump. <Yeah. laughs> you know, the, the, but here's the problem, right? I mean, here's a problem that I, I have found. You know, it's like, okay, people say you should read and, you know, you should, you know, you should go out and discover on your own, and especially reading, right? Reading, watching things and so on. But the truth is, if you don't participate in a direct way, like if you don't have exchanges with people in groups that are different from one your own group, I mean, I found this in my own life, right? Um, without those personal interactions and personal exchanges, I really didn't grow a lot. I can read, I can discover lots of things, but, you know, it wasn't until I come up against things. You know, so I'll just give you, here's just a perfect example. The other day I was at an event and I was interviewing this woman who was blind and I've seen her around campus all the time, right? And uh, for the past 25 years, she works at Penn State. And while I, I said hello to her and I reached down to shake her hand, and in a split second, as I'm reaching down to shake, shake your hand, I'm realizing, well, she doesn't see me. It's, a com- it's just a really common thing. Of course, she doesn't see me, right? She's 100% blind. So I just touched her hand with my hand, and then that was the signal for her, for us to shake hands, right? And then we shook hands and talked, and I interviewed her, you know? But the point being... I thought about that and I thought about the awkwardness of that moment that really wasn't awkward to her because she's blind and she didn't experience anything that I experienced, right? The only thing she got was me touching the back of her hand, just sort of like this. And that, then she opened her hand up for me to shake. But I thought, you know, if I hadn't had all of the experiences that I've had with people, not just with disabilities, but including people who are blind, that would have been really awkward for me. And it wasn't. And I thought, There's no way I could read about that. There's no way I could have read about from the perspective of, let's say, you know, I I read a book or a paper or an article about someone who's blind saying, here, this is how I'd like to be treated and so on. I mean, I could read about it, but until I have the interactions, and even that's me, I put my hand out, even I know of all of my experiences with people who are who have visual impairment, but including people who are 100 percent um, blind, I, I would stumble over it and you have to stumble. You've got to. So, um, the best way to educate oneself is to find communities and go experience and be part of those communities and just do it. And it's just, it's quite surprising. So for me, you know, like this is one of the reasons I travel a lot is because I want to engage in certain communities, but I just want to, you know, I just see people like I, I saw her at this event and I was interviewing people and I said, Hey, I want to interview her. Like I want to exchange with her, but most people probably are afraid of the awkwardness. And so they would kind of shy away from that sort of thing. So that's a really long answer. I know, but it it's the best possible response. Um, it's just, just do it. Um, hey, by the way, about class today, I have to say, um, I was sitting in this very chair. This is my home office. And I was sitting in this very chair this morning. It was about 9.30 or 10 o'clock this morning. And I felt excitement about today's class in a way that I have never felt in my entire life about a class. I've been teaching for 35 years, and I never felt the level of pure joy about going to a class that I felt today. So what that means is Tuesday, I'm gonna do today's class 
And Tuesday, I will have the opportunity to experience what it is that I was anticipating today. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I have another question for you. All right. Uh, what do you think is the biggest issue that faces our modern world? Of all that faces our modern world? Yeah. Well, I, I have to say, I hate to say this because it sounds cliche-ish. Um, the number one issue is, I think, I think, like, I, again, I, I think it's climate change. I think it's the changes that are happening to the earth itself. Um, I'm going to believe the, the, the earth scientists. I know they're getting some things wrong because they're still collecting data. You know, I, explain, I was explaining this to somebody else. People say, someone was asking me about Al Gore and the inconvenient truth and how so many of his facts were wrong. And I said, or it didn't turn out to be true. And I said, well, you know, look, that was 20 years ago. I mean, we've, we've invested so much money and so much time and so many really smart people have been looking at the issue of climate change in ways that they never had in the past 20 to 25 years because, you know, they were still collecting data before that came out. And we've learned so much because we've really put our attention to it. So of course he got things wrong because we've discovered new things. You know, if we put the kind of energy into um, robotics that we put into who know our own gene research, right? We would we could think about what we could learn. Well, what we're gonna? How about self-driving cars? We will in 20 years. Cars will be doing things that we can't even imagine today because of the kind of energy we'll put into it and, and, and the resources. So that's what's going on with climate change. So, of course, it's changing all the time, our predictions and our understanding. So you can't hold somebody accountable for something that we thought, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So that, that, that's the number one important thing. Like, don't trip up over that. Um, that's science, right? Science is changing all the time. So... Um, and if it's not, if scientists aren't shifting how they see things, then they're not studying anything that's really that important. They're studying the same things over and over and over again. So this, you know, this is like um, like evolution. You know, we're coming up with new thoughts and new predictions and new understanding. I saw that one of one of my colleagues, Nina Jablonski, um, it came out was is now talking about um, peoples in the Americas uh, who. Have, there are certain um, people with certain, uh, they're finding genes for light skin among Asians who crossed over the Bering Strait and then became indigenous peoples in the Americas. And so we, we, we thought, hey, this light skin in the Americas and among native peoples, um, it, it must have come from the Europe side, right? So Europeans brought that over. And Europeans brought their light skin and mixed with indigenous peoples of Asiatic origin because Native Americans are from Asia, right? If we go back, you know, 16, 20,000 years. And, but, but now we're discovering, wait a minute, no, no, no. There was a variant of some genes um, that predict light skin that actually came over from Asia. And I thought, wow, so you're, we're changing the story about skin pigmentation in the Americas, just like that, right? So it doesn't mean we got it wrong in the past. It means that we're just discovering something new. That's the cool thing about science. Awesome thing about science. All right. Um, oh, how about the question from Bossum? The one, uh, thanks Bossum for that. So if you don't know, or well, most of you don't know, um, Lori, my wife and I went to um, Iraq to spend time with our friend and, and colleague, uh, Basim Razo, who is, by the way, um, we did a live stream from there, Jeff organized a live stream from there, but um, who is now spearheading our, the Iraq um, camp of world in conversation. So, um, so you're asking, what's the one thing that surprised me or that, that I, about my experience that I didn't expect to see? Um, well, I think the thing that the, I knew, I know that, um, 
my experience in traveling in the Middle East is that Arab culture is a very generous culture, um, very hospitable, um, very giving, very generous. And um, I think I didn't, I didn't expect the amount of generosity that I felt, the, the amount of almost, uh, yeah, just, uh, just accommodation to these two Americans who are part of this government that has created so much pain in, in this country, um, in Iraq. And I, I, I ex just experienced a, a kind of a generosity and a warmth that I, I, I didn't expect the opposite of that. I just didn't expect the amount that we got, you know, really, you know, everywhere people were just pleased to meet these two Americans, you know, so simple things, you know. I think that goes back to what you were saying about understanding people that aren't in your community, going to those communities and experiencing and asking them questions. And you did that same thing in Iraq. So I think that just goes right back to your point of learning from people who aren't like you is going. Yeah. Experience yeah, yeah, that yeah. world for once. Yep. Hey, Rishab uh, Somani asks that you're asking this question about disabilities in the in mental, you're actually looking at mental health um, in Asian countries, China and India. Yeah, look, I actually just uh, read this piece from the BBC about Nigeria. And this isn't mental health, but it was with um, Alzheimer's in Nigeria. I'm going to swing back around to this. And what it, what it was, it was a, a, a conversation about how, you know, um, mental health services in Nigeria, while they move forward in, in, you know, in some ways, I mean, you know, moving in certain directions, but in the, with regard to Alzheimer's um, and dementia, have not really been able to find a way to accommodate this, especially in more rural villages where people, when, when elderly people get dementia and Alzheimer's are really seen as being somehow possessed and oftentimes locked away, shunned, pushed away, all sorts of, all sorts of things that one might never expect only because dementia and Alzheimer's is just not a conversation that people have been having. Um, and so it was really just this, this analysis of how far behind. Now, this isn't mental health, right? But the mental health issues um, and how some cultures are really not moving forward, at least in the West. You know, the West sees is with our more individualistic kind of understanding of things and less um, larger family systems in which family members really take care of other family members. So we have to create a mental health system whereby people can get help to acclimate or accommodate or continue to live in society when they're struggling mentally with various issues. Maybe it's depression or anxiety or any number, or some kind of psychosis. So you see, because in, so in the West, certainly in the United States, we live in these nuclear families and then everybody just sort of goes off on their own. Whereas in traditionally and in many cultures, people live in large extended families. So if somebody has mental health issues, the family is there to really take care of them. But here in the West, the family is not there. And you really have to re survive on your own. So what we've done in the West and in the United States is we've created mental health institutions to help direct and guide people to keep them on the path and get them back on their feet um, if, they, if, they, if people are struggling with something, right? And so this, what this means is that in many cultures, they don't need to have a lot of advanced systems in place, health systems in place to address mental health because it's just dealt with in families. But it's not really dealt with medically, right? Because people don't know how to deal with it, but they somehow just adapt and deal with people who really need to be dealt with. Whereas in the West, it's pretty obvious, you know? So if you can't get by and you have some psychosis, you know, you're gonna end up on the street and then we see people, but you can hide. But if you have a large extended family, you can kind of hide. I don't want to use the word hide, but you can kind of protect those people or keep them insulated in a way that life can keep going on. So that's really an awesome question. 
Um, um, yeah, yeah. So Molly, yeah, the, the the issue with your grandmother. So you think about your grandmother, right? And think about imagine that your grandma has Alzheimer's, but she's also really active, and she's kind of moving out in the world, doing things and engaging, and they can't control her because she keeps getting up and she keeps leaving the house and she keeps going. And so then eventually, what are you going to do, right? If you don't understand what this is, you might imagine that your grandmother is possessed in some way. And then you got to lock her in a room or you have to tie her down or you have. So, um, so there's this big movement anyway in Nigeria. That's what this article is about to educate people about what Alzheimer's and dementia is. It's pretty, it, yeah, it's pretty cool. It was just Nigeria. I mean, it just happened to be that country. But, you know. um, do I have any supernatural beliefs? Um, uh, it's not that I have supernatural. I, I'm not sure. Huh. Yes, I have beliefs that I have beliefs that I have experienced things that cannot be explained. And in, in a sort of kind of logical positivism, I guess, that we kind of live with in the West. Um, I don't have, I don't have any, you know, like, yeah, so I don't, I, no, I don't have many supernatural, but I have experienced things. Like my body has been, I've been in situations where my body has been taken over by some kind of a spirit that I, it wasn't scary or anything, but it clearly was something entered me and took over my body. So one time it was a Native American, I assume a Native American spirit, not a question. I started singing in another language that was not mine. And I was aware that it was happening, but I couldn't stop. Like I was, while I was experiencing it as it was happening, and yet it was just coming through me. And then eventually I stopped and there's no question. I mean, I don't, those things don't happen to me. So when that happened, it was really big and I was singing out loud. It was really, I was in a, the middle of a, of a sweat lodge, Native American sweat lodge a ritual. And then one time I was in Tokyo, outside of Tokyo, Japan at a temple. And my body was, was, I was meditating in this um, temple with hundreds of Buddha statues, uh, and my body was taken over by something, and it was also not scary, but it was supernatural in the way. So I don't have any beliefs about very serious beliefs, or I don't know about that I kind of hold on to, but I don't believe that that what I see in this world is what actually is. I think there are other things that I really can't see, and Yo, which is. Uh... To add a comment to what you're talking about with Alzheimer's, I didn't get to uh, jump in. Molly, I definitely feel you. My great grandmother had Alzheimer's, um, and it was usually when I was younger. She never knew who I was. Um, she never knew who my sister was, who's about four years older than me. Um, and then at, to see her over like the first twelve years of my life decay, like go from knowing who her children were to not even knowing her who her husband was was really scary and really freaked my, my grandparents out, her uh, mm. son and uh, daughter-in-law. So I definitely feel for you. It's, it's a horrible thing that happens and we do need to talk about it. Wow, well, man, yeah, yeah. Hey, a couple of people have asked how I thought the government shutdown was going to end. Um, yeah. I I just think that they'll, they'll just come together on a, on a compromise somehow and, um, I, I don't I don't know who will compromise somewhere, but I, I think it's but it's going to happen. I think it, I mean it has to happen. I don't know. It's just really or they'll pass an emergency bill and this slowly they'll just start will you know, kind of sort of like chopping away at what is actually shut down, such that the things that are really still shut down or really tiny and then we'll just sort of stop and forget about it. Yeah. You don't think there's going to be a really... national security call at the border? Yeah. It'd be t tiny th things like that. And then, you know, it'll just kind of, we'll, we'll just look back and say, wow, what happened? I don't know. I mean, I, that's, that's, just, I just, yeah, my gut feeling. Do you think there's going to be a wall? Stop. 
Is there going to be a wall? Yeah, like in all said and done, do you think Trump's going to get his wall? No, you'll never get a wall. It's two. It's over two thousand miles of of on, of land. It's, it's impossible to build a wall or a you know a small fence at best. And even then, like you you understand like how many miles that is. Like you have to go to the border. Like this is one of those cases where you know it's like traveling, right? You have to go. Like when I was in Iraq. And, you know, we're, you have to understand how big the world is. You have to understand how big Iraq is to understand that there can be a, a, you know, like a conflict happening in this one area here. But, you know, you can go even 20 miles, let alone 800 miles, and there's nothing happening over here. Right. Just like in the United States. So you got to see how big the world is. Well, you got to imagine how big that border is and what it would take, how much money it would cost far more than five billion dollars. That would that's barely going to cover a tiny portion of it and what it would take to build a wall. I mean, it's just first of all, it's just impossible, you know, and all you got to do is get on Google Earth. At, which I don't even know if you can do because they've never even taken video of the area where we would have to build the wall. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, I, I almost would say comical and laughable, but I don't want to say that because then I sound like a precocious jerk, but it's just, it's so big. It's so massive. You know, just think about going over a mountain in a desert and like, and you got to get all that equip, all those materials, you have to get it to that place. So you have to build roads down, so many roads to where you would bring the materials in. It's just almost, it's just impossible. So they were, we're arguing and talking about things that, I don't know, but take a trip down the Southwest and just start walking. Imagine walking some 2,000 miles. And this is the stuff for me that drives me crazy sometimes that we argue about things that we don't even need to argue about. Five billion dollars will get nothing at all. Yeah. Staying on politics, if you want, uh, what is your opinion on the military trans ban? Hey, uh, hey, um, Rishab. Yeah, I, I just saw your response to my question. Um, yeah, a lot of families don't want to because they're they don't want to acknowledge the mental health issues because yeah because they're afraid. I mean, who, we don't have the ability to. Nobody, very few of us have the ability to really think about these things. And it's scary when you have a family member who is um, going through something. And yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. Anyway, go, um, go ahead, Jeff. What, would, what was the question? Uh, just uh, about the military ban on trans soldiers. Well, listen, one of the, you know, I was one of the, this. I'm thinking just one of the course recently has... Uh, I don't think approved of it. I think that they just kind of passed it along and haven't really done anything, yeah. but it's more yeah. so allowing the ban to continue. Well, you know, so here's the thing with the military ban, right? Um, there is a, if you don't know what's happening in the United States is that um, there was a, we kind of put into effect under the Obama administration that sold people. If you're enlisted in the military and you decide that, you know, really you are trans, right? You, you whatever your gender is, your that, that life has assigned to you, biology has assigned to you, it's not the correct one, and that you would like you'd like to change that um, and do it through having a physical operation to do that. Um, then the United, the government, the military would pay for it. I mean, this is part of your soldier, you you work for the government and then, okay. So if you are trans and you're going to transition, then, then we are obligated to, to pay for it. Right. Just like we would pay for any operation that somebody had. And on one hand, you know, if you're an activist and especially in the trans community, that's, um, so by paying for it, that might mean like top surgery. So if it was a woman who's going, uh, 
female to male, a woman to a man, maybe have top surgery, removing breasts. Um, you know, this, this uh, so the, the cost or, you know, taking testosterone or taking or hormone, hormone therapy, we would pay for that. Um, so for women, testosterone, you know, to start growing facial hair and that sort of thing. Um, the cost can be, I don't know, maybe depends on the surgery, but they can, it can get pretty costly. But the question becomes like, well, hang on a minute. Why should the government pay for that? Like, why should we pay for that? And what about people who are trans that decide, hey, I'm going to just join the military so that I can get taxpayers to pay for this operation? You know, if you're a person who doesn't believe that this is very common anywhere, that most people who have this idea that they're a man inside of a woman's body or a woman inside of a man's body, you're going to ask the question, like, why should I be paying for that for somebody else? So that's the issue that's on the table, and it's a legitimate issue. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not weighing in on it one way or the other. I'm just saying it's a legitimate issue. What about people who would just join the military just to have the operation? It's like, okay, I'm in now. Like, now I want to get my operation. I mean, this is, I mean, it's not going to happen very often. So, I mean, very few people are going to join the military to have the operation. But nonetheless, if that's, if that's what's really on the table, should taxpayers be on the hook for that, or is that's the same? Should taxpayers be forced to pay for that? So um, I don't know. I, I'm just willing to listen to. Um, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. This question's way different. Have Wait, hang on, hang on. I want to respond to Kevin. Kevin said, can't we consider trans surgery to, to be non-essential? We could, but the Obama administration went beyond that and, and said that they were actually more essential. See, so that put that means the taxpayers are going to be responsible for it. Now, I'm not. I'm fine if I'm going to sp spend money on, you know, if like an, that a, an F-35 aircraft is a hundred million dollars, right? It was initially supposed to be like ten million, and now it's like eighty or a hundred million or something, right? Or bombs that we're going to drop on people. I would rather pay for somebody's surgery than to. Um, buy another bomb to honestly. So like, I'm fine. Or, you know, or military equipment that the arms, the services don't even want, you know, these, the, you know, the different, um, yeah, equipment that the secretary of the army or secretary of the air force or say, we don't even want this equipment, but the politicians force it onto them. Right. I would much rather pay for surgery for human beings, but that's me. All right. Go ahead, man. Um, have you ever been to India and what do you think about its culture? Yeah, I have been to India three times actually. And I love Indian culture. Um, it's immensely complex. It's really, I mean, just, okay. For, first off, you know, just Hinduism to me is, is really cool. Um, and it's just such an old culture. How could it not be? utterly fascinating. I don't understand it because it's so old and it takes so much to really get inside of it. But, um, but what I know and what I've experienced, um, I, yeah, I, I love it. Right. And, you know, there are customs and things that I don't like. Right. I mean, there, there is, there's more uh, slavery in India, for example, than anywhere else in the world than any other country in the world. Um, but, I mean, so there are like quite a number of things, but in terms of just the culture and, and people, I find in him, yeah, it's just, it's great. Also, very um, gracious culture, by the way, very giving, yeah. Uh, There's lots of okay. uh, comments about skin, skin color and beauty and what are like the, uh, I kind of want to connect to this question, like what are the, the norms of beauty and or the most essential how about the most essential qualities of beauty that and then if you connect yeah. that question I, i'm going to ask this off, off, off. well happiness what? yeah okay i will all right i got that so 
So here is a, one thing that I've been thinking about recently um, a little bit is just what would I think is beautiful if I was socialized in a box, right? I mean, how could I say that? If I was socialized outside of any culture and that nobody ever had an impact or told me what was and was not beautiful, whether it's the shape of a, the body, the skin tone, texture of hair, um, what would I be wearing jewelry, wearing certain clothing? I mean, it could go on and on, right? What would, what would I authentically be attracted to? What an awesome experiment that would be to take some people in every culture and just kind of isolate them, give them just enough socialization that they, you know, we're human, fully human. Right. Because, you know, if we're not socialized, we won't be fully human. I even talk about we see this with people that have been raised with no human interaction whatsoever. You know, you don't even learn to walk upright. So like people walk, children who haven't been taught to walk will walk you sort of bent over and that kind of thing. Right. So you really need socialization. So if you gave people just enough socialization that they really we're fully human, and yet you didn't teach them anything about beauty. What would they, and we did this on cultures in different continents and so on, right? What would they be naturally attracted to? And I thought, wow, what an awesome experience that would be. What an awesome experiment it would be and how cool that would be, even for myself. Like, I'm lucky that I was raised in a family where I was not taught. Um, I don't ever remember my mother telling me that certain things were beautiful or not beautiful or ever, ever, except a couple young girls who I went to school with that, you know, the boys sort of didn't like or people didn't like for one reason or another. I don't know, you know, just like it, it kind of got bullied or whatever. But one in particular who my mother said, you know what? She's gonna, she is gonna be the absolute most beautiful girl of anybody in the school, right? And that's the only time I ever remember her saying anything about beauty. So I had the really lovely experience of not being socialized with being infected by somebody else's understanding or interpretation. Now I was infected because I grew up in a mass culture, right? But it wasn't in my home. And so I really was able to um, be free of that to a great degree. It was pretty cool. So anyway, that's a thought. Um, I've never been to Pakistan, by the way, Sanya. Uh, I was actually, when Lori and I went to Iraq, we, we were initially planning a trip to Lahore um, to give a series of talks this past December. And then just a lot of things just kind of started to get in the way. It was really a difficult trip. It was hard kind of working with Penn State and different things. Um, and then we, we, and so we had a conversation with Bassam and then we decided, Hey, let's, let's move forward our initiative in Iraq. We were going to go from Pakistan and then stop by Iraq on the way home. And then we decided just, we would go to Iraq. So, I would like to go to Pakistan and will go to Pakistan. Um, definitely not afraid to go. Um, it's just a matter of when there are so many places to go to. I also have to go to Afghanistan. In fact, I was having a conversation with my colleague and partner, Rafi Nadidi, and I said this to Mr. Rashidi, another colleague and partner in Afghanistan, that Lori and I will come to Afghanistan for sure. So. Um, mm. yeah hey so molly what you're saying about like uh 20 shades of like white foundation four for people of color and stuff yeah i mean look part of it is part of the fact that the you know the, the beauty industry is going to be more focused on white people 
in, in the United States, it's because there are many more white people spending money on beauty products in the United States. And so um, yeah, this is kind of, the, I'm not saying there's, there's not an element of prejudice uh, associated with it, but understand that it's also, there is, that the free market is in effect, right? And so when you go to India or China or Pakistan um, or any number of sub-Saharan, Nigeria, as I talked about a little bit ago, you, you're going to see beauty products that are really more aimed at darker skinned people. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. So, um, Do you have your beads on you right now? Hey, you do. These are beads from you're up from Boston. Yeah. Somebody asked a question about the beads and uh, what are the beads that you were always holding? Well, the, these are prayer beads from Iraq, but I, I generally have, most of my beads are Muslim beads, only because I just have, I get them from uh, my Muslim friends. But I do have some beads from Greece. Um, when I was in Greece, I bought some, I call them more like worry beads. But you know, people use them all the time. Um, they just help me to stay focused and remind me to not get too um, bothered or just, yeah, just stay focused and stay calm because it's really hard to, to talk about these issues and stay really engaged and calm, yeah. Um, hey, by the way, okay. um, you know, the light skinned and fair people are considered more beautiful because the idea that light is good and dark is evil. Uh, I, okay, so this is uh, Rishba, right? Samani? Um, no, Rishab. Sorry about that. Uh, actually, it's kind of funny. I had a really cool conversation as a result of one of the videos that I did on Asia on China and skin color, I had a really cool conversation with somebody who was Korean and who contacted me from Korea and then we engaged. One of the cool things about doing the live stream and having people from other cultures watch is because people from other cultures also weigh in and tell me the places where I get things right and get things wrong. And I'm clearly, I'm more, when I start talking about other countries, I'm more, if I talk very much, I'm more likely to get things wrong than I am to get them right. But anyway, we had a really cool conversation about the skin tone in China and Korea, for example. Less, you know, light, the preference for light skin and really white skin being less about wanting to mimic the West and the preference for European beauty and more of a preference for children and and, you know, the, it's sort of the in, in, it kind of like an infantile, I, the, the preference for infantile skin, like really youthful, super youthful and super young skin. And so anyway, we had a conversation, it was a cool conversation. And I really saw, you know, that's at play also, um, very much at play. And you see that, you know, like in Japan and Korea, I mean, you see it with, this sort of the elevated, like anime and like what, it's all about little kids, right? Like it, it, and how much of the culture is really about little kids, little kids and advertising and being sexualized in all sorts of ways. When I was in Japan, when I was in Tokyo, I went, I had to go really experience a lot of this. I mean, I wanted to go experience a lot of it. The way in which youth, very young people are sexualized in these really bizarre ways. Um, I say bizarre because, well, okay, I, okay, interesting ways. Some of it's really bizarre because I, it's bizarre in the sense that I don't understand it. It's not necessarily bizarre in the way that it's wrong. It's just that I don't understand it. But um, yeah, so anyway, that's kind of also where white skin's at. Yeah. This is, these, this is co coconut pulp. Yeah, awesome. I keep forgetting that. I have to remember that. They're really amazing. Uh, yeah, ro it's just like rosary beads. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? It's really fun to answer these questions, by the way. Um, um, it's cool to. There's another one. Um, there's actually two. 
Um, thoughts on Brexit, and then is there such thing as an inferior and superior race, and how did we get there? Okay, Brexit. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen with Brexit, honestly. Uh, I am... I'm really stunned to imagine what's going to happen. I saw this big Airbus just turned up the flame today because Airbus has said, look, if you all don't fix this, we're going to start making plans to pull our wing manufacturing for the Airbus. One of the, the main wing manufacturing plant is there's one in Wales and there's another one in England. And they're saying we're going to move out and move down, back, bring it into the EU. And that is just, when you start going to those places with so many jobs, it's like 16,000 really well-paying jobs, um, something's going to have to happen. So I don't know what's going to happen. And I think a lot of, if you're not in, if you're not part of the EU or not part of the UK and you just keep hearing this Brexit thing and you're not, you're not paying attention, I would say, um, pay attention, just to, in, to take an hour or so and investigate what's going on and what's happening. It is, it is major um, for the future of uh, countries coming together and forming these trade blocks. So um, it's just having a, a, a major impact. So what was the other thing? Um, inferior and superior races. No, I don't, yeah, I don't have any, I don't, well, first off, there are no races, right? So all we have are different ancestry groups that share common DNA admixture, right? Like groupings, mixings or groupings of DNA that they give certain appearances, right? And the DNA admixture is always overlapping and so on, but um, there, there's no such thing as a race, meaning that there's a, a distinct group of human beings who have distinct admixture that is very clearly different from everybody else. That's just endlessly overlapping all the ancestry groups. So what we find are, we do find um, um, genes that exist in certain geographic areas of the world that don't exist in other areas of the world, which is why we can do this biogeographical um, DNA testing that we do like 23andMe and ancestry.com and that sort of thing. Um, but honestly, uh, yeah, there are no, that probably, okay. But if I want to say the superior, if we want to talk about superior ancestry group is probably about the, the most mixed because what we generally find is that mixing up really, um, I think I'm not a geneticist, but from everything that I see and read, um, mixing up pr provides, um, a stronger um, gene pool, for example, like with dogs, right? If you want a dog that's going to be the healthiest and live the longest and less likely to have particular genetic deformities or genetic problems, don't get a purebred dog, get a mixed dog, get a mongrel dog, a dog that's on the, on the streets. And so similarly, what, what, from what I understand of all sort of genetic coding is like we'll bring genes from lots of different areas of the world or population groups and put them together and that will be that will strengthen so so a lot of i know some geneticists that you know who i know one in particular who is um has um done artificial insemination and and then brought genes together from different areas of the world just with this very idea so uh, um, okay, what else do we have? Um, There's one from a little back ago uh, asking your thoughts about European society. Uh, have, yeah, so I spent a lot of time in Europe. I really like Europe. I mean, every country is a little bit different, certainly. I, you know, I was just in... Um, well, when we came back from Iraq, we spent a couple days in Turkey and then we passed through Italy. I have not been, I had not been to Italy in 35 years. Um, and my first love is Spain. That's where I first lived abroad for an extended period of time and then went back and did it again. Um, but yeah, Europe is, it's not, 
not the same as the U.S. It's just, it's just a different feel. Um, hey, by the way, I don't read much fiction at all. Um, I, I used to um, read the read like Kurt. I read I've read all of Kurt Vonnegut's works, and you know there, there are a few authors that I just like reading, kind of funny but insightful. Kurt Vonnegut. If you've never read Kurt Vonnegut, I strongly encourage it. Um, but I just don't anymore. Um, John Irving is just a, a writer who is so you know. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. I just don't have time anymore. I, I have the idea that later in my life, as I kind of wind things down, maybe a little bit, I'll go back to reading fiction. But, but the one book that, if I had to take one book on a desert island with me forever, it would be Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. It's 110 pages. Um, it's a very small book. It's it's the only one that I would I would t- if I if I have got to take one book, it would be that. Just a book about understanding the difference between religion and spirituality. It's about taking the journey. Um, amazing, amazing book. Um, the best description of a deep spiritual experience of understanding the spirit, understanding the interconnectivity of all of life without postulate, without needing to postulate a creator God that I've, that I've ever seen. Um, compared to religion, where people go through a series of ritualistic steps to try to approach, to have an experience of the divine, right? So you go, religion is about creating the rituals, and you go through those steps, and you, whether it's, you know, Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or Christianity or Judaism, it doesn't matter, but you go through those steps, and the more you do those steps and, and you do it, you integrate them into your way of being and you do it subconsciously, then through that experience, you find the divine, you find the holy, right? And that's one way to get there, but there's another way to get there, which is just connecting to the life force itself without any of those rituals. And that's what Herman Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, H-E-S-S-E, walks the reader through both of those um, approaches with the story of these two characters. It's really amazing. The other person that I would recommend uh, is uh, the book that has changed my life probably more than any book in terms of religion is Joseph Campbell's The Power of Myth, just an interview with him at the end of his life. So um, where he just allowed himself to speak wisdom. Mind you, I just gave you four authors, and all four authors are white men, straight white men, I should add, which is really fascinating. But, um, it's not that I only read white men; I just gave. Uh, I'll throw one in there. Actually, hold on. Let me go get. Let me grab it. Hey, by the way, talk, talking about Sikhism in my class, um, it, you can see Marina Kata, which I got in India. I think if I had to choose a single religion to follow. It would be Sikhism. Um, I would say Sikhism, and people, you know, and then I have to turn around and say Sikhism because that's in the West we say that. But it would be. It's the closest to my to postulating a creator God. Okay, I don't postulate a creator God. Okay, but if I did postulate a creator God and all of the forces that come together, Sikhism is the closest to my belief system. The tenets of Sikhism are the closest to my personal belief system of any religion that I've ever encountered. encountered. And uh, so in Mr. I remember when Mr. Rashidi and I, who I don't know, I think you're watching, if you're watching the stream, remember when we went to that Sikh temple in, uh, in New Delhi, how, how just amazing that was. I still have that photo of you walking into the, the, the temple, how just really cool that was. So, um, yeah. On the fiction side of things, I recommend A Song of Fire and Ice or Game of Thrones for all of you fans of big magic and old school stuff. And for uh, the libertarians in us all, well, in me at least, uh, Anne Rhine's Atlas Shrugged. My dad read it in 
who read it for 15 minutes every day for a year and uh, has taught me many things from it. I, uh, I, I haven't read it yet because uh, I take forever to read. However, it's on my, I literally, Sam, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm actually shut. like I have the book, this yeah, well, that's thicker than the Bible, that's the, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the yeah, that's the first one. Well, yeah, I read head too, but yeah, yeah. I anthem I I read fairly recently. Um, yeah. Hey, so somebody, um, China's social credit system. Look, I, what are my thoughts on that? Um, Man, you know, let me just say this. One of the things about me is that I'm really a generalist, meaning that I'm not an expert on any one thing, but I spend, a, because of the work that I do, um, I spend a lot of time learning about lots and lots of different things. But it means that I also run the risk of saying really dumb and ignorant things. Um, because I don't know enough. I know I'm, I know just enough to say something, but I don't know enough to not say something dumb. But from what I understand of China's social credit system, it seems really cool. Um, it seems like um, a, a really, again, it, it, it's a, going back to something I said earlier, it's a system that you don't need when you have a very tight-knit society and you have a society that's based on communitarianism. Right, whether it's the family or small social groups or larger social groups that are really working together towards some cohesive end and helping each other out. But when that starts to break down, as it's breaking down in China, and as more and more Chinese are migrating to urban areas and then really kind of living on their own, well, they have to recreate families. And so you do in the work environment in China, right? It's really. Um, very much a, a different kind of system than, like, say, a work environment in the United States. But you also have these other places, these gaps where people people need services, and you can't provide those services. And you haven't. China has not built an entire infrastructure on individuals being able to go out and receive service, paying for services that they're going to get from some other institutional. Um, organization or something. So China has come up with this social credit system. That's what I'm understanding. Trying to keep track of it, um, it's such that you know you um, the the kind of the the give and take of what needs to happen um, would be just immensely complex. And I think you could do it. You can even do it. You know, like on maybe on your phone or something where you you know you. Can, back here and I, I, I earn certain credits and then I spend certain credits, but God, I don't know, man, if that's the, if that's the world we get to, cause we have to get there, then that'll be really fascinating. But I don't know. It's going to be, that's going to be tough. I was reading about it the other day and thinking, you know, of, of a system here in the United States is similar to that. I'm just like, how are you, how are you going to do that? How are we going to keep track and people not scan it somehow? now so i don't know interesting i want to read more about it but you know yo this second uh, question that was brought up last class um when we talked about blackface in the netherlands they have their black pot yeah. what are your thoughts on it yeah well you know look this is just a it's not rooted it's fine it's not rooted in um in in mockery of some sort, right? Um, it's, yeah it's, yeah, it's not rooted in that. So, you know, you're not sort of, and again, mockery, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's not, it's really, it's a deep tradition that goes back many, many, many years. And so you have the same thing in Germany, you know, like where, you know, Santa Claus is, um, is not necessarily white skin. I mean, so yeah, it's, 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 it's cool, it's great. It's lovely. It's not. It's not based on, you know. It didn't emerge out of a of a need or a way to, of holding other people down. Yeah, which is what we have here. And not all blackface is mockery, mind you, right? But the point is, it's going to be. And I should have been more clear about this in class. It's going to be seen that way. So you can do blackface and not be doing, not be mocking somebody in the United States as a white person. But it's just going to be seen that. Way. 
So that so it doesn't matter what your intent is or whatever. It's just that's how it is. So it's just like okay, don't do it. Yeah. For for when you were studying in South America, first off, which country was it, and what was your favorite dish from that country? The first first country I oh man the first country I went to in South America was Ecuador. Um, I took a one month trip with a friend of mine who was going back to visit his family. And the, my favorite trip from that time was Kui, which is guinea pig. In the U.S., it's guinea pig, so it's a little like rat-like animal. Um, just it's a delicacy. It's eaten by it's eaten in the rural areas in particular. It's common throughout the Andes in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, parts of Colombia. Um, yeah, it just is, I, I mean, I'm not a big. I I don't eat. I don't like to eat factory farm meat at all. So, but I, but eating meat that is, uh, um, we say in, in England, in the U S we say free range, you know, animals that have lived. Yeah. have not been lived in a, just a really horrific conditions. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Eating meat. I try to not eat very much of it, but anyway, so, but of that, of that meat, Kui is probably my favorite. Yeah. So that was my first country. And then the second country was Mexico. And pretty much any food I ate in Mexico, I loved. So, you know. And then I back to Ecuador because I did my doctoral research in Ecuador. So I went back, I don't know, five or six times. And uh, now I go to Colombia a lot because I, yeah, I go to Bogota. Um, okay, what do we have? The, the impossible I have burger. Right no, so. I have not tried the impossible burger, lab made meat. I would like to try it though. I can imagine what it would taste like. I have a, a sense of that. I, I, yeah, I suppose I will try it for sure. The impossible burger. Uh, the only other thing I saw was. <laughs> Listen, uh, man. Wait. Hang on, Lake, I would go to Lakehead University in a heartbeat. I mean, yeah, look, look, here, the problem is if I turn my camera around, you would see that there's no snow at all outside. So we had, we, we had a weather, a bad weather day. It wasn't because of snow. What happened was it's been raining for the past uh, 24 hours. And in the temperature, right about the time the school let out and people commute a lot this afternoon, the temperature while like, while the streets are really wet was dropping from like 40 degrees down to 20 very fast, which means that everything will freeze up and then everything will become a sheet of ice. And so that's why everything's got canceled here. But yeah, I would, um, I, last, yeah. last, last March, my wife and I were in St. Petersburg, Russia for about 10 days and it was really cold, about five degrees below zero. Uh, on a regular basis every day and it was really cool I really really enjoyed it um, yeah yeah I was a little confused about why we have off today uh, and then I live off of a major street downtown here and it was just bumper to bumper and I was like oh the roads must be somewhat bad because everyone has stopped it was literally bumper to bumper yeah bad. yeah okay Hey, Jamila, hang on. Can you tell us something amazing and bizarre and crazy for your very active mind to dwell on? Um, wow. Let me think about that. Hell yeah. Hey, uh, thoughts on Venezuela. Look, it's here. Look, you know, Venezuela uh, is a is a country that for quite a number of decades had a you know a very tiny ruling elite, relatively speaking, right? A ruling class that's very strong, very powerful, and so on. Lots of oil. Um, that's one it has the you know I mean be, be in the West anyway in, in the Americas beyond be, as far well, from what I understand, Canada is, has the 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 greatest source of oil in the, in the Western Hemisphere. The most oil, and then I think uh, maybe uh, we actually think I've been reading 
really, we think actually the United States because we think there's a lot of oil that's undiscovered, but then Venezuela and then Ecuador. And so the, the money really stayed in the hands of this of relatively small group. So there's a lot of inequality in America. And then there was this move on the, with a kind of more of a socialist takeover and um, for quite a number of years. And then the country just gradually kind of ground to a halt. And, and, uh, and it's just really, it's tragic what's happening now, just to watch things, watch the country fracture in the way that it has. And what's the number of, of uh, people leaving, you know, going to Colombia? That, so I've, I've met many Venezuelans in Colombia who have traveled there just to survive. I mean, it's just really, tra- it's immensely tragic. Yeah, it's very tragic. And it's scary, too, because what we're seeing in Venezuela, this kind of meltdown, could happen anywhere. And, and it can happen really fast. And so... Someone asked earlier what I thought the number one issue in the world was, and I said it was climate change. But the second issue is just social breakdown as a result of inequality and uh, and climate refugees and inequality. And once we see it in Venezuela, we can see it in lots of places. So it's really pretty scary, honestly, how quickly these things can happen. Um, so it's unfortunate, which is what makes the Trump administration for me, um, which is bothersome in a certain sense, right? That how, when you exacerbate those fractures and you exacerbate the, the, you know, the, well, the fractures that already exist in society, and then you play one group against another group, as we see the current administration doing, much more so than the Obama administration, and way much more so than the Bush administration, just sticking here in the United States. Um, it, it, I, I understand the, the desire to sort of uplift, you know, the disenfranchised working class in the U.S. and this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's just, you gotta be really careful. It's so, it's, it scares me a little bit to see how quickly people can, can be brought into combat with one another. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, so I don't like the fact that the government shut down for over a month, but at the same time, well, first off, look, I don't work for the government. So I don't, my pay doesn't come from the government. So I, there's almost a way in which I, I don't even feel like I want to weigh in on the fact that the government is, is shut down. Like who am I to say, like, I don't, I'm not impacted in any way whatsoever, mm, but it's, so it's, it's troubling actually that, that we have the political parties that are sort of running the show, that they find that the way for them, they think the way for them to get the most amount of power is to even take extreme measures like shutting down the government. Because you understand, right? It's not who's running things in the United States are, are the political parties. So these elections are really about them. And uh, and then, you know, you, you know if you look at, yeah, I don't know. Just look at how many people are employed, how many people, how many jobs are at stake. How many, it's just about, it's about the parties. It's, t- it's all about the parties. So, yeah, um, r- right. So take like the Greek crisis. So I, I had to, I spent two weeks in Greece, not this last summer, but two summers ago, really when the crisis was just getting kind of worked out. So I, I in order because I knew I was going there. I read quite a number of books, including by the the one, by the, by the really hardcore kind of leftist uh, sociologist, like political thinker, I forget the guy's name, he's a driver. He was in parliament at, at some point, he was the, the finance minister or something, he drove around Athens in a, in a black leather jacket on his Harley Davidson, that guy, he's quite well known, but, but read lots of people from all sides. Wow, the Greek crisis is a good example of how fast things could just fall apart. Um, uh, yeah, the U.S. definitely favors dominant countries. Why wouldn't we, right? 
Like if you're if you're in charge, if you have a country and you're in charge, you want to ally yourself with the ruling classes in other countries and with dominant countries. And so we did. That's what we did, right? You know, like dictatorships are fine. If they're if the dictator is on your side, then and you can buy them off, then it's great. It doesn't matter if it's Chavez and Venezuela or it's um, Saddam Hussein or it's that's Assad in Syria, it's, it's irrelevant. Or Putin, I mean, look at Putin, like it's all good. Or, or you know, this, this guy who's kind of really running the show in Chechnya, right? Who I was actually going to talk about briefly in class. It doesn't matter who it is, but you, you dictators actually produce stability. And so they're good. If you want to invest in a country, you want to invest in a country that's stable. So um, dictators can work really well. They'll hold down their their populations and use force and violence to really kind of hold things. Um, you know, like like you know, we see in Zimbabwe, right? Right now, what's happening if you're not following what's going on? So they'll hold it down, and and then you your investments will be more secure. So we're seeing this with China right now, and their investments in in Africa. So yes, the U.S. does that, but every country does that. You know, you don't want to invest in an unstable environment. I mean, right? I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. But you know, if I have my money and I want to put it somewhere, I want to put it in an investment tool that's going to be stable. That's why we, you know, we invest when you as you when you want more stability, you invest in bonds as opposed to stocks, right? So it's like this is. I mean, I'm not going to go into the difference or whatever, but that's kind of what it is. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, so the U.S., of course the U.S. is going to find certain countries to dominate, right? That's just how it is. Any, any country that's on top is going to use its power to dominate other countries. I mean, that's, that's how you stay on top, right? That's how you get there. Um, yep, Germany's in the EU, right? Germany's going to, has more power. Its economy is bigger. And it's going to be able to, to say many more things about what's going to happen. For example, Germany has more to say about Turkey and Greece than Turkey and Greece have to say about what happens in Germany. And that's just going to be the way it is. You know, so. um, I have a huge number of concerns about Ukraine, by the way, uh, and about what Putin what the Russians just said, the Russian Federation, man, they just said like Ukraine may not ex may not exist. You know this whole, and I know that Putin, you know it's just words, right? But yeah, I, I'm really. So we were. I was in Kiev, um, I guess two and a half years ago, maybe. And once again, I took the opportunity to really read a lot, and then I what we Lori and I watched. She was Lori went over for a conference she was invited over to speak at a conference and I just tagged along because I wanted to go to, to, to Ukraine and uh, so I spent a lot of time watching um, sh news coming out of both Ukraine and then coming out of out of the out of Russia and I just really tried to take a perspective right so Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. So Eastern Ukraine is really aligned with Russia and Western Ukraine and pre-Ukraine is aligned with NATO. So I really wanted to understand what these two perspectives were um, and what was happening. And I was really amazed at how, um, how much sense the Russian perspective meant, how much sense it made if I just took that perspective and just let, let me just be Russian for a second and take try to have their understanding about what's happening in Ukraine. And I totally saw it. And I saw that the U.S. and NATO was completely wrong, right? I could see that. And then I could take the U.S. and NATO perspective and see that Russia was completely wrong. So, but in any case, the, the answer is, yeah, I have some concerns about it. Um, the, the Ukraine elections. All right, man, what do we have? Anything else we, we could... I'm still trying to come up with something that's really wild and yeah, uh, yeah. I got I, okay. I got something for you. So one thing that when you see a, I'm I'm looking out at some trees out here. 
the trees actually appear to communicate with one another at the root level. That so the trees are communicating part of the tree that you can see, but also they're communicating, their roots are communicating with one another, right? So when you see a forest, um, know that beneath the forest is a whole way of communication that's going on um, that you, you can't see and you, you would never see. How utterly fascinating that is. So um, that's pretty cool. So read about that, about how trees are engaging with one another. And this is this is sort of what I, I guess you could get at with the supernatural. I don't think that's supernatural at all. That's just nature that we don't know, right? Just like we don't know how bats can fly without being able to see, like they have sonar. And what is sonar? What is it? Like, you know, how do bats not have eyes and they can fly around and see and be able to pick mosquitoes out of the air that are not even making a noise, right? Little bugs. So there's something really amazing. It's actually not amazing at all because if you understood it, if we were all bats, then we would understand it. It would be very simple, right? But for us as humans, Imagine being able to see and communicate without being able to see is pretty awesome and pretty fascinating. So once again, it's not, for bats, it's not fascinating at all, right? But for us, it is. So it's like UFOs. I have this idea that there, of course, there's life in the universe. The universe is massive. It's, it's virtually unending. As far as we're concerned, it's unending. It's limitless because never get to the end of it. Um, I mean, it doesn't appear to be, but you know, whatever it is. So you got all the, so there have to be other beings out there, right? There's other life. Of course there's other life. Maybe it doesn't look like us or whatever, but there's a, there just has to be other life because it's too big for it not to be, right? And so, um, well, if you think about extraterrestrials visiting Earth, and then the question is, well, why don't we ever see them? Why don't they make themselves known to us, right? Well, why would they, right? Why, why should they care? Because it's like I walk across the grass, and I don't stop, as I'm walking across the grass, I don't stop and dig in the grass and find tiny insects and try to communicate with them, because they, I know that they can't communicate with me. So I don't even make myself known to them. They're irrelevant. I can't, they, they can't understand me and I wouldn't understand them. And even if I could understand them, I wouldn't even really be interested. I'll just sort of watch them from afar. Well, what makes us think that extraterrestrials are life beings from other, other galaxies um, are not doing that with us? Like, why would they make themselves known to us? And why would they ever try to communicate? We have nothing to offer them. So um, they just get what they need by kind of observing us and, and understanding us. Obviously, if they could get here, they could understand us in ways that we would never, we wouldn't even know that they're understanding us. And so um, it's just a thought that I had one day that I've sort of hung on to. And it really makes a lot of sense to me that that would be how extraterrestrials would, would operate. That they don't. And, and, you know, we've only been around for a short period of time, and the Earth is really old, and, you know, human beings have only been here for a very, very tiny fraction of it. You know, you take like a football, like a, a soccer field, right, like a, however long a soccer field, and then you take one tiny blade of grass and put it at the end of the soccer field. His, history on Earth is the entire field in human history, or Homo sapiens is that one tiny little blade of grass. In the in the the you know the 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 galaxy is basically endless. So it's like how you know, you know that's just my there. There's a thought to leave you on. I'll leave myself on that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we have more abilities than we know than we even know. Like we can't even get there. Like where are we going to be in a you know and and if we survive in another thousand years, the kinds of things that we could do. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and who knows how we, how, we look, where did consciousness come from? You know, how's it emerged? Maybe somebody put it here on Earth. 
I don't know. It's cool. It's awesome. But the idea that people have, I'll say this, the idea that there's that somebody wrote a book 2000 years ago or that like the Upanishads or something, you know, further back than that with the Upanishads, what, 3,500 years ago? When were the Upanishads written? Somebody write that into the chat. Um, but Or it could, could be that, whatever it is, right? The, the fact that somebody wrote a book to explain all of life just happened to be like, you know, a couple thousand, you know, a few thousand years ago. And then somehow I'm going to stay with those ideas in that book. I mean, that makes, that's silly. That makes no sense, right? So I'm a sociologist. So I say it's silly because I'm a sociologist. Like that's not how society, I, I, I can't think like that. It just happened that at certain points in time, some books were religious texts were written and for whatever reason, some things were knocked out of the text, other things were brought in, and some texts hung on. All the religious texts that didn't hang on, like they got pushed aside, but some actually were able to maintain themselves um, through the future, right? And so here we have them. And now suddenly we're going to believe them. Like I'm going to believe this Bible or the Quran or something. It's like, come on, I have no reason to believe that. Um, the world is way more complex than that. So I, that's why I don't believe any of those stories. Um, they're, I mean, they're stories. They're cool stories. And a lot of it's allegory, which is really cool. But um, I have no reason to believe that that's how the world started. I mean, the, the idea of, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which includes Islam, that there's a God and God created the earth in that way. I mean, maybe there's a God, but God didn't create the earth in that way. That's the story that somebody told. But but if you believe there's a God, then who created God? Then you have to believe that God is just all omnipotent. God is has been, always has always existed, always will exist forever. It's like okay, that's cool. That's a really nice way to see it, but. I just can't see it that way. It's too much of a mystery for me um, because I can't not ask the question, well, who created the God? And because I can't answer that question, I can't then assume that God exists, this thing. So I just walk away. I, I just sit in the mystery. And that I think is what religions exist to do, to point us toward the mystery and but we lose track of that of focusing our energy toward the mystery by trying to argue about the stories that were written to point us toward the mystery and i just want to stay in the mystery the divine the place that moment this is the joseph campbell stuff i just want to be in that space where i am just mystified by I'm just uplifted by the fact that life is so amazing in and of itself. Like trees are communicating at their root level. Like that to me, or bats have this sonar system where they can pick tiny mosquitoes out of nowhere. Like how do they do that? That's a mystery to me. How did human beings get here? How do I, how, how do my ears work? How everything, like how does this happen? So that to me is what's so glorious about life. The books that human beings have written to explain things to me is just like academics writing silly journal articles that tell us nothing about life itself. So I would much rather stay with the mystery of it. And I find that that's where most, you know, in every religious tradition, there's always a part of the tradition, you know, um, like 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 in in uh, like in Islam, it's the Sufis, right? That I really connect with a lot, right? And I connected with them the first time I was in Turkey. That's when I actually it was a Sufi with whom I converted to Islam accidentally, right? But um, but in, in Christianity, we have our own spiritual traditions, and um, and in Buddhism, we have our own, the, the, the spiritual traditions, the one where people just spend a lot of time meditating on the idea of the great mystery. And But then you have other people that are arguing over the text that somebody wrote and what they really mean and, you know, the, the, um, the hermeneutics of that process. And I don't want to be in that world. I want to be in the mystery world. So...
That's what's pretty cool. Yo, that, man, God, I don't get to talk about this in class. Um, yeah, well, you know, men and women are different rather than unequal. Yeah, and the difference is the mystery, the ways in which we're different. And if we could uphold those differences without having to get into the inequality in the political and social and economic justice issues, but really just uphold the differences, not just not all men and women, right? Because sex, men, man and woman exist on a continuum. So at one end, or people probably exhibit the most manly type physical and psychological and sociological characteristics and at the other the most woman characteristics physical psychological sociological and even spiritual and emotional right and then between those two extremes are everybody else right until you get to the even in the middle with someone who's completely androgynous and containing you know just a embodied of parts male and parts female including physical right and I met people. And then, so you get a man like me that I, yeah, I'm pretty male, manly, but, but I'm, but I'm not, but I'm not that, I, I got a lot of, uh, of, I'm not, I'm not sure. Or, you know, people who are like gay men who are not way down here, but rather exhibit a lot of char characteristics um, in their ways of being and even in their actions that they really didn't learn that are much more female, like a, a feminine, right, or female. And, and sometimes men will just take that on, like gay men or straight men will take that on. But sometimes it, I've met young children who at the age of four, I'm already seeing boys at the age of four who I say, it's really fascinating. It, okay, so yes, Kind of the boy wants, he wants to play with dolls, which is really fascinating because nobody told him to play with dolls. You know, in fact, they were telling him to play with trucks, but he still wants to play with dolls. But he's exhibiting behavior that we typically define as effeminate. And I think it's where you see some gay men who are, who have that kind of effeminate quality, right? Like, but I see it in four-year-olds or three-year-olds. And I'm like, where the hell does that come from? So that's not learned. And so therefore, it leads me to say the male and female is not just the male and the female, but a continuum that exists on this. And so same with young girls who at a very, very young age, we, we call them, you know, in the U.S. we use the word tomboy, but that's not, you know, just very much more macho, much more like at a young age, you know, like three years old, right? I had friends had a daughter who just refused to wear dresses. And it was just clearly like she was not comfortable in a dress. She was never going to be in a dress. She wanted her hair short. She just was, she walked like boys like, like she just imitated, didn't they imitate the boys. She was a boy, right? Like she was boyish in that way from the moment of her beginning socialization. And so it's like, wow, that's, awesome and fascinating and really, really cool. So the fact that we feel like we have to put people in boxes and stay in those boxes to me is just as tragic as feeling like we have to believe a certain way of seeing God, right? We have to take it on and we have to believe all components of that because somebody told us to. So Jeff, do you want to weigh in on that? That's a kind of a cool idea. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, you, you kind of said everything I was thinking. Yeah, it's, it's really cool, right? Where does that kind of, that thing, where does it come from, right? You see it, you see it in the LGBT, in the U.S. now, we just use this word queer. Again, I said it in class the other day, it used to be a, a negative term, and now it's become more, it's a political term, but we see it in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. We see all these different just more uplifting these different ways of being, you know, it's pretty, it's really cool. All right. Listen, man, I think, uh, how do I feel about Chinese buying out housing in Vancouver? No, listen, man, how do I feel about that? The Chinese are going to take their, are taking their money out of China. And of course they are. And they're going to start buying up 
housing everywhere in the world. Look, China will be, if we survive in 50 years, China will be calling the shots. Mark my words. I wish I could be here to watch it, but China will be calling the shots. Mm. I'm not, hang on. I'm not disregarding the idea of like Plato, right? Pl uh, um, um, that the, the kind of little, um, yeah, the, the ideal, yeah, the ideal never exists. It's like democracy doesn't exist. It will never exist. Freedom doesn't exist. It's an ideal type. Democracy is an ideal that you shoot for, but it doesn't exist and cannot exist in its purest form. It's just something you shoot for. This is the, the sort of um, Plato way of Plato's way of seeing these things. So. Um, there was somebody who Molly just said, as a member of the LGBT community, my friends and I have reclaimed the F word. We didn't actually talk about the F word in class on Tuesday. Um, not really. And I think it's interesting because like some people are reclaiming it, like black people yeah. are taking the N word. And then others are refusing to do so because it's so discriminatory because a lot of people will be like, well, you don't like, um, one of my friends, my friends would always say in like, uh, high school, like, oh, the, uh, fag just means like a pile of sticks. And it's like, yeah, but where were those piles of sticks? And they were oh. under the crucifix, like under the, like, you know, not a crucifix, yeah. under like, uh. The cross yeah. would be burning gay people. So yeah. there's always well, a wait, connotation with it. But how do you, okay, but how do you feel about so Molly is a woman? How do you feel about women, even whether they're lesbian or bi or whatever, right? Women reclaiming the F word as opposed to men, because the F word is about men. So Jeff, I'm asking you that. How do you feel about that? Like it's one thing for you to reclaim it, but what about women reclaiming it? I, I don't. I think it's a, a very personal choice. I think it doesn't matter on which gender you are, uh, for the most uh -huh. part. I know a lot of men. I don't know personally a lot of men. I should say, but um, there's a podcast I used to listen to a columnist from Seattle who used to always talk about like how some particular men it's their turn on to be called negative things, right? Like. And, and mm. for any gender and any person, you know, a, a woman who wants to be respected in the workplace, but in her private life, sh she wants to be told what to do. Like that's, that's just what happens. Why? Because sexuality is freaking crazy. Right. So there's some yeah. people who are retaking the F word and saying, well, this is the word I want to use. Whereas others are like, no, I don't want to. So personally, it's a personal choice. It's what I'm trying to get down to. For me, I don't yeah. really ever use it. And on class on Tuesday, when I, or yeah, on Tuesday, when I said, um, I jokingly said that I give permission to Sam to say it. It was under the yeah. number one, the assumption that my friendship with you, I would understand that you wouldn't use it in a negative way after like it wouldn't yeah. be like he would go and start, you know, joining Westboro Baptist church. And you're like, well, I can say it because a gay person told me I could because I knew yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you're an educator. And therefore when you use it, it's going to be under educational purposes. Yeah. Um, yeah. whereas other people who might use it are going to use it for very negative reasons. If you want to hold the F word and say, this is our word, then get ready for people to use it against you. And you can't really say anything because you're putting that word up to the open market. Yeah. So if you want to use it, go for it. If you don't, don't. And if you really are yeah. against it, then preach about the actual meaning behind the word. And then we'll, it'll get to the point where. Like it's uh, racist to call people colored people. Well, it'll be yeah. a super homophobic thing, especially since homophobia is becoming way less than it used to be. Like there are still people who protest outside of gay weddings, but way less, way less. And the people yeah, who are yeah, getting counter protested by the Dude. average person whose family is gay, like their their kid is gay, and it's like holy, sh like <laughs> my kid's gay. I can't yeah. think of this the same way. And that's what it comes down to. Like we said at the very beginning of this video, the very beginning of the live stream, the only way that you're going to come to understand a different group of people is by experiencing their lifestyle. So like when I came out, my parents have, they may have known a four or five, six gay people in their entire lives, adult lives, you know, kids are different, whatever. But like in their experienced lives, they only knew a few. And then it was like, well, of course, gay people shouldn't be able to get married because it's against the Bible. Cause that's what they knew. And yeah. that's what I knew. And then it was yeah. 
oh my God, there's somebody in my family who I'm directly connected to. And now they're in this balancing act between holding on to their relationship with their child and upholding these religious beliefs. And it goes back to the F word. It goes back to holding this word that has so much power, especially hatred and ho- and having this word that you want to use for yourselves. It's all a balancing act. And you have to realize that if you use it, people will use it against you. And there is well, a difference in America between the words should or can and should, because people yeah. are like, I can say whatever I want. Yes, in America, you have the right to say ideally whatever you want besides fire and fuel yeah. here, but you shouldn't because it goes down to your cultural and societal. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Maturity. Like if you're yeah. to the point where you understand what those words mean, you can say them, but you'll realize I shouldn't say it because it will make me look like an a, a, a hole. And I tweeted you know, on Tuesday, just don't be an a-hole. Like, just don't be a dick and you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, so I, I was, I was been thinking back to probably about 10 to 15 years ago that lots of people in the, in the LGBT community were dropping the F-bomb a lot. Men. It was really just common. It was a playful thing, you know, and now... I don't, I don't hear it very much. So how quickly it's like, it became a thing where you never said it and then it was said all the time. And now I rarely hear it. So it's, it's really fascinating, you know, um, how quickly these things change. And, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, if we're just paying attention and, and we don't get frustrated, it's like, well, just, you know, just keep our, if, we, if, if, you know, if we truly live in a multicultural community, then we're going to keep track of the kinds of ways in which people speak with one another. And then we'll adopt along the way. Like I keep changing, you know, I just, I just allow myself to learn new words and, and, you know, cause I want to be part of these different communities. And so, you know, it's like, like, you know, handy, when I was part of the disabled community at Rutgers, it was the handicap community. Right. The, the, the organization was called the Handicapables instead of handicapped, handicapped, able, right. Handicapable. And like, and then, but you know, then suddenly handicap just is no, 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 we can't use that anymore. That's negative. And so then it becomes disability. And even now at disability, people are starting to question. And so it's like, okay, I'll, I'll just go along with it. I'll change, you know, because it's more fun that way. I don't want to be stuck in the past. I want to be a person that is living in the realm that I'm in and or in the time that I'm in. So I, I don't want to be, you know, like the, the, that old person who says, well, when I was young, this is how we did it. It's like, oh, come on, man. Like, no, I want to. That's what's really fun about teaching and then being around young people in a, in a college, at a university, is that I have I have the opportunity to be kind of learning or being connected with what is the sort of the, the new things. You know, what are the new things that are happening? What are the new trends, the new ways of of thinking and talking and so on? And and I don't mean and that doesn't mean that young people have all the best ideas because they absolutely have very few of the best ideas, but. I find that it's more people my age that tend to have the really coolest ideas because you've had 30 years of really serious thinking about things, you know, but. Um, there was also a question about um, Canada's bill C-16, which is how Jordan Peterson became as well known as he is now. And a lot of people always think that you, like they always ask somebody out here a couple of times, uh, would you ever debate Jordan Peterson? And the whole, I, I would say you wouldn't, because you're not much of a debater, you're much of a thinker and asking people questions and understanding why they think the way that they do. But the whole C-16 bill, I would actually, for a gay person, I, mostly because of me being a communications person, the uh, bill C-16, which mandated that you use the person's proper pronouns, it is an oversight. It's a complete overhaul of constitution in America, the constitutional rights of free speech. And so, yeah. and that, and that goes back with having the, the societal and cultural maturity to understand what people mean by that. So 
I can't mandate you and put you in jail. And this is where Canada yeah. should stand. Yeah. I can't mandate yeah. you to call me ma'am because I, I'm changing my gender. Yeah. But you should want to. And society will push that forward so that people will just accept whatever. Because I don't know very many okay. people. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I'm with you on that. Like, for me, don't. Here's my. I'm with Peterson in the in in this sense, right? Like, I'm not into mandates, right? Don't tell me what I ha- or you can tell me what you would like, right? How you would like to be referred to, for example. And I and I'm like, oh my gosh, of course I want to accommodate you. So if you want to be called they or them, which is kind of common, I mean, I, I'm like, I'm a, you know, okay, I'm gonna question that because I I just don't. My gut feeling, I I could go into why I would question that, okay? But, okay, but it's fine. But if you want to, but that's for another place, right? That's for a very different kind of conversation, right? Um, but I'm fine, okay, I'll call you that. I don't have a problem. Um, but if I don't do it, don't get mad. Like if I forget or I'm not told or I don't know or whatever, then don't be annoyed and pissed that I should have known or I should. It's like, and most people aren't. But there are a few probably extreme activists in every community that are going to just take things really, really far. So I'm definitely not into man, and I, I'm definitely not one to mandate anything. What I find is that human beings will mostly come along and do what's best and what's right and what the other what what would be kind and thoughtful to other human beings if they are given the opportunity to do so. And if those other human beings explain to them why it is that they would appreciate that they would do X, Y, or Z, right? So I hope that makes sense, my God. So in other words, let me say it differently. I find that most people are going to want to be accommodating to other people. So if you watch, if you stand at the threshold of a doorway, most people will hold the door open for somebody who's coming behind them. Most people will pause and let somebody else walk in front of them. Most people are just, most people will treat other human beings with respect. And that means if someone says, hey, I would, I would, if I say, I would prefer that you call me Sam instead of Samuel, most people will call me Sam. They would say, okay, that's fine. They might ask why, how is that? They might say, well, I'm really more comfortable calling you Samuel, but I'll call you Sam. That's fine. That's how most people will be. So there's no need to mandate that human beings call me Sam. Like, so I'm generally going to be against mandates like that, that people will come along. We will do what's, what's good and right and thoughtful and kind. Um, I would say that. So I'm not in the, the candidate bill would be like, okay. Yeah, and, and it's funny because um, we said this, you said this at the, like I think the first class of the semester, but now people are going and somebody was jokingly saying now you're going to be, you're going to be called a transphobic professor because you don't line up with that super extreme side of you know you don't go on the far left you everyone must be mandated no it's a simple exchange of communication between two people I would yeah. prefer you call me this name rather than this name. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah, exactly. I'm with you. Um, that's where I'm at. Man. Just say it and we'll move forward. Hey, this is going to be my last thing. Uh, called a transphobic. <laughs> trans, well, no. Wait, I'll be called a transphobic. Wait, I'll be a transphobic professor? That's the joke because you didn't go too far. You, oh, yeah. you didn't mandate it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I got it. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's really funny. <laughs> yeah. God, I know it's terrible, right? Hey, uh, my opinion on quantum entanglement, I really have no idea what that is. So Samat, send me, send me some article that at my personal email, um, I unlearn at Gmail or Sam Richards at PSU.edu. Some article that's short, not really long because my brain is fried that explains what that is because it sounds really awesomely cool. I think I know what it is. I mean, I know what it is. I can I can say what it is in the most general sense, just from the words, quantum entanglement. But that would I'd like to see something on that. Hey, um, listen, y'all. Uh, 
Thanks for joining. My gosh, we've been on for a long time, um, almost two hours again. But we, but class on Tuesday is going to be really, really, really awesome. I think so. Um, oh, a yes or no answer. Do you believe free will exists? Just yes or no. Oh man. Uh, yes. But it's so, but it's so, the degree to which it exists is so inconsequential. Yeah. Like I have the free will to lift, to wrap my beads around my hand right now. But what is that? Everything surrounding it. Uh, yeah. Well, it's so, calm. that's such a. Cool. All right, y'all. Um, thanks. I appreciate it. And and thanks for, uh, Jeff, thanks for putting the live stream together and doing what you're doing. Like, you're rocking it. Jeff, uh, the, our, the stream, our stream moderator and World of Conversations technology guru is just doing an awesome, amazing job of, uh, yeah, dude, you're just, you're just bringing us into the 21st century, so. Thanks. Cry. And I, it's cool that you were actually talking today. It's really nice to hear your thoughts on some of these things. So, um, so thanks everybody. And we'll catch you on the, the next round and be well. Peace out everybody.